The Knowledge Network, British Columbia's educational television authority, transmitted to over 130 communities in BC by Canada's Annex C satellite. Basic Fire Behavior and Suppression, a six-part course presented by the Province of British Columbia, Ministry of Forests, Protection Branch. Hello again, and welcome to the last of today's three broadcasts on the telecourse, Basic Fire Behavior and Suppression. In this one, we present Module 5, which deals with suppression activity, putting out the fire. And after we have a look at that, we'll again take your calls if you have any questions about it. Uh, then we'll go to Module 6 and finish up for the day. With me again in the studio are Jeff Bates, who is the manager of fire, the fire management section of the protection branch of the Ministry of Forests, and Fred Marshall, who is a forestry instructor with Malaspina College in Nanaimo. For those of you who have, are just joining us for the first time or who have missed some of this, this course is designed to train people who have no experience in forest fire suppression to fight fires and do so safely and efficiently. Registered students are being asked to write a test, and those who pass will be given a certificate. If you haven't registered for the course, if you do want to write the test, contact the nearest Ministry of Forest office and speak with a fire protection officer. Now, many of the district offices will wish to train additional workers beyond those who write the test today. So don't hesitate to call them. If you have missed part of our program, tapes may be available. Now let's go to Module 5. We're watching Module 5, Fire Suppression. When you are called out, it may be to work on a large or project fire. It will be useful for you to know what has happened before you get to the scene. The first person at the fire site will do a size up and will report back by portable radio on the conditions at the site. The information which he will give will be on the size of the fire, the time, the wind speed and direction, the fuel types, fuel arrangement, and any other observation such as an abandoned campfire. When this report has been made, the suppression action starts. There are three basic rules of fire suppression. These are fast attack, aggressive action, prompt and complete mop-up. In the initial attack, the objective is to stop the spread of the fire, suppress the fire, and then do the mop-up to ensure that the fire does not rekindle. Air tankers may be called in to assist in the attack by dropping retardant. But the ground crew is essential, as only a ground crew can make sure that the fire is out. Helicopters may also be used to drop retardant. Retardant, as the name implies, will retard the spread of the fire, even when it dries. The attack strategy is based on the fire triangle. Remove the fuel, or remove the heat, or remove the oxygen. The crew will at attack where the fire is most likely to escape. They will hot spot. That is, they will cut off the spread of the fire by constructing unconnected fire lines in front of the fires which are burning the fastest. Once the fires are stopped from spreading, all the fire lines are then connected. If there is more than one spot fire, they must not spend all their time on one fire and let the others get out of control. They will cool down spot fires with water from hand tank pumps or by shoveling dirt on them. They will separate fuels and knock down low-hanging limbs to stop the fire from going higher up the trees to start a crown fire. They will dig a fire line around each spot fire. Remember, this fire line must separate fuel and therefore must go as deep down as mineral soil. Snags inside the fire line must always be felled Snags outside the fire line, but close enough to catch sparks, must be felled or be surrounded by a fire line. The crew will cut down and remove any small tree which may candle. To candle is to blaze furiously or flare. This will spread the fire to the crowns of other trees. They will turn logs to lie uphill or block them with rocks, or dig a trench under them to stop them from rolling downhill and spreading the fire. They will separate piles of burning limbs and logs, cool these down with dirt or water, and place a fire line around the pile. 
The fire line which they build will vary in width and depth to suit the situation. The depth is always down to mineral soil. Mineral soil does not contain fuel. The objective is to prevent the fire from bridging the fire line to separate burning from non-burning fuels. A fire line must be built to surround all of the fire. When it is decided that a fire has grown too large for the initial attack crew to control, a larger force is mobilized. The fire is now considered a project fire, as it calls for a great deal of organization. This is when you will be called to the fire. There are five basic work functions which you will be involved in. These are fire line location, fire line clearing, grubbing, burning off, and mop up and patrol. There are three methods which are applied when attacking a large fire. These are the direct line attack, the parallel line attack, and the indirect line attack. The direct line method of attack has the best results. However, it can only be used if the fire is not too hot or spreading too fast. The direct line method calls for a fire line to be placed along the perimeter of the fire to contain only the burning fuel. With this method, the possibility of the fire escaping is greatly reduced. The attack is first made where the fire is most likely to escape. Mop-up is done when the fire is securely under control. Mop-up is discussed in Module 6. The parallel method of attack is the next choice. If the fire is too hot or running too fast for the direct attack method to be used, yet is slow enough to allow a parallel attack. The parallel method calls for a fire line to be placed parallel to the fire's edge. As you can see, this method leaves an area of unburned fuel between the fire and the fire line. The strategy is to burn off this area in a controlled way so that it does not cross the fire line. When this burn off is done, the fire line has been widened and there is less chance of the fire escaping. The distance between the fire and the fire line is left to the judgment of experienced firefighters, but could vary from 50 feet to 250 feet. The decision will depend on the fire behavior variables discussed in Module 4. The location of the parallel fire line will depend on the location of any natural barriers, such as rivers, lakes, and rock bluffs, as well as man-made barriers, such as roads. The suppression strategy with the parallel method is to encircle the fire with a fire line burn off the unburned fuel between the fire and the fire line, mop up, and then patrol. The indirect method is used on the larger, fast-moving fires. The strategy is to make a fire line well in advance of the front of the fire and burn off the fuel before the main fire reaches the area. In this way, the fire is robbed of its fuel and its movement is stopped. The decision as to where and when to burn off requires many years of firefighting experience. Advantage is taken of fire-caused winds to control the direction of the burn-off fire. The availability of experienced personnel, time, and terrain are the critical factors in attempting the indirect method of attack. With large fires, it is more common to use a combination of the direct and the parallel methods of attack. The indirect method is used only on the fast-moving and larger fires. You are most likely to be involved in these larger or project fires, so a word on fire organization is important. At a project fire, the organization is headed by a fire boss who supervises crew bosses, who supervise straw bosses, who supervise firefighters. A straw boss may have up to 10 firefighters under his supervision. It is of vital importance that you understand that you report to your straw boss and to that person alone. The size of the fire organization will depend on the size of the fire. Having about 500 people in a project fire organization is not uncommon. This includes cooks, timekeeper, tool and equipment maintenance people, radio operators, and others. Let's review what we have covered in this module. Suppression action follows a reliable size up of the fire. There are three basic rules in fire suppression. These are fast attack, aggressive action, prompt and complete mop-up. The attack strategy is to eliminate one side of the fire triangle. Without fuel or oxygen or heat, 
the fire cannot exist. The fire line strategy is used to remove the fuel. Burying the fuel is the strategy used to remove the oxygen. Hosing with water is a strategy to remove the heat. Fire will burn at three levels, ground fire, surface fire, crown fire. There are three methods of attack, direct line, parallel line, indirect line. After the fire has been controlled, mop up and patrol action starts. No matter how large the fire and the fire organization, you report to one person only, your straw boss. Okay, we're back and the switchboards are again open if you have any questions. We must give priority to the people who are registered for the course uh, in terms of question, but uh, it doesn't matter if you're registered or not, as long as you're on topic, we'll try to get you in. The telephone number is in Greater Vancouver, 228-1411, and long, for what would be a long-distance call, although we cannot accept collect calls, please call us toll-free at 112-800-663-1277. And while we're waiting, let me, uh, Jeff Bates, ask you one thing. Is the strategy pretty much different in almost every fire? Each one requires a different approach? That's right, Jim. Each fire is almost without exception, somewhat different from, in my experience, uh, the fire that we fought before. So it's necessary for the fire boss to size up the situation, forecast what's going to happen at least in that particular burning period, and then in a safe and efficient manner take action with the men and equipment that he has, or the people that he has on that fire. In that triangle, when you're trying to remove one of the three things, I take it to get control of the fire, the, the most obvious one to remove is the fuel. That's right. That is the primary uh, objective of any uh, fire boss of, of a fire of any size. And I, when I say by that, uh, one hectare or, or over, you might be able to eliminate oxygen or eliminate heat from a fire smaller than that, but your chances aren't very good. Fred, uh, over at the blackboard, this business of the fire line, how big should they be? How wide? Is that the question you just can't answer? No, that's a very good question, Jim, and a confusing one. We've covered a lot of different terminology in this uh, module today, and I'd like to just uh, re-emphasize it, maybe clarify some of the points by means of this illustration. We have a fire perimeter that may look something like this, and uh, this is referred to generally as the fire perimeter or the fire edge. As opposed to that, we have what is referred to as the fire line, which we also refer to, or some people refer to, as the fire guard. And the width and location of it depend on many things. Why all the way around? Why, if, let's say that fire is burning from uh, the bottom to the top or from south to north. Why would you need one at the bottom if it's burning the other way anyway? Okay, let's say that our fire started here, is moving us way, let's say, up a fairly steep slope, and uh, we, of course, are going to build our fire guard at the head of it to uh, stop the movement of the fire. We must also build it at the lower edge to uh, catch any, any debris that may roll downhill and uh, thereby spread the fire this way. A change in wind direction can cause the fire to move this way. Uh, the fire itself may create its own uh, convection currents and own wind, and it may build up and create its own firestorm and move practically in, in any direction. Therefore, you must contain or put a perimeter, a fire guard, or a fire line all the way around the fire. Back to your question about the uh, width uh, location of the uh, fire line itself depends on many factors, uh, such as width. If we have, say, a, uh, a crew of 10 men and lots of time, we can probably build a fire guard that might be a meter wide. If we've got two men, and 10 minutes, our, our guard may only be uh, 15 centimeters or six inches in width. So the number of men you have with, uh, with you, the amount of time you have to construct that guard, the types of fuel you have will influence the, uh, the width of your fire guard. Strategy there being that if you've uh, got a little bit of time and a few guys, build a quick one, and if it doesn't work, you can build a larger one later? Right. Yeah. If you've got a, uh, 10 minutes and uh, the fire's burning hot, build it quick and dirty. If you've got all day and the fire is burning slow, build it as wide as you, uh, as you feel necessary. Right. Other factors that we could uh, consider, like say, are fuel types. If we've got a very light fuel, say just grass along the edge, we can get by with a narrow fire guard. If we've got heavy fuels, heavy slash, large debris out here, say timber, then our fire guard 
must be wider to keep that fire from moving into that uh, fuel. Topography uh, and slope are uh, other factors. If fire moves rapidly uphill, I must have a, w a wider fire guard at the head of a fire or at the top of a slope. If you're alongside of a fire or at the bottom edge, you need different types of fire line. Here, your fire guard can be, say, relatively narrow, up to uh, a foot and a half or 45 centimeters, 50 centimeters. At the bottom, uh, you might get by with a 30 centimeter, but you might you want, you want to dig a type of a trench so that any any rolling debris will be caught in that trench and won't roll down the slope and spread out. Fred, if we could uh, get you to hang on for a second, we sure. may have we've got calls that may be about this. Stay where you are. We'll take one first from Smithers. Go ahead, please. Uh, I've got a question about compensation. Um, oh, sure. Go ahead. How much? How do you get? How do you receive that? Well, like as in any uh, situation where you are, are you talking about uh, compensation in the event of injury or pay? Uh, in the event of injury. Okay, uh, once an injury occurs, you would fill out your workers' compensation board forms just the same as you would in any other industrial accident, okay? Uh, but how much are you paid? Like, uh, how often? Well, the objective, of course, is that we do not get anybody injured, so therefore that is uh, of not uh, primary concern in, in this particular course. I believe the workers' compensation board rules would apply as any industrial accident. Let's take one other quick call from Williams Lake before we get back to Fred and the fire line drawings. Go ahead, Williams Lake. Yeah, on that uh, 10 o'clock uh, uh, deal, like on suppressing a fire, uh, I was wondering, like, last course took last year, it said 6 p.m. to 10 a.m., and then judging by your pie graph there today, it was 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. or something. Okay, that's a, that's a really good question, and we do get a lot of uh, confusion about that. Our policy, of course, is that there will be immediate action on any fire. We certainly don't want to leave the impression with anybody's mind that uh, we will wait till 10 o'clock the next day to contain it. But having failed, or if it takes hours to bring this fire under control, we say that it should be contained or under control no later than 10 a.m. of the day following discovery. Okay? Okay. Back to uh, Fred at the board. D is the fire line going to be the same width all the way around once you decide on a width, or will that vary? No, the width of the fire uh, line, like I say, will vary with many things. The fuel, the time you've got, how easy it is to dig. If you're digging a line in uh, very thick brush and, uh, or solid rock, obviously your line's going to be quite narrow. So it could be a meter at one spot and three meters at some, some other spot all in the same fire. A meter at one spot at the head of the fire, uh, you may want to uh, build a very wide, you may have this up to oh, 30, 40, 50 feet even. Although that would be probably an exception built by, a, say, a DA cat at the head of a fire. So the woods can vary considerably. And uh, we effectively then remove the fuel from the fire and we strengthen this fire guard here by the process of burning out. Which we have these fingers here or we have uh, our fire line located on top of a ridge at a safe enough distance ahead of the fire, we had time to put men and equipment out here. We can't just leave that fire guard because the fire can jump almost any width of fire guard. I mean, there's no magic width that we can say the fire will not jump, but fires have jumped canyons, they've jumped four-lane highways, uh, they've jumped rivers, and so we can only uh, construct what we feel is feasible out here and then widen that guard by means of the practice called burning out. So you would burn out from uh, the fire line at the top rather than from the fingers? We would generally try to uh, burn back from the top. You generally use topography or a slope or some kind of anchoring, but this might be a road, your cat guard. And if you do have a line along here, it's generally narrower. Um, it may be a ridge top, maybe just a small hand guard. And of course you want to backfire or burn out from your uh, strongest point and work down. And certainly you will generally light a strip along here, burn it out, and then perhaps move down again and burn along like this and ultimately burn that out and effectively have removed the fuel from this part and thereby widened your fire guard to that. Um, can you say anything at all about unburned figures? Are they of use? Uh, unburned fingers, uh, are, are they of use? Are they dangerous? These unburned fingers in a fire, let's say this fire burned up here like this and this was all burned out and we had this burned up here and we had this unburned finger in there. That is a real danger spot for us. 
these areas can burn out at any time. They can start up. Uh, they can, you can lapse into a, a sense of false security. You think you've got a perimeter around the fire, and then uh, you reduce your manpower. And if you leave this area here unburned or unprotected, it can start up again and easily again and jump your perimeter that you felt was safe. So these unburned fingers are a real source of problem and a real hazard and a danger. And we must always burn them out or, uh, or isolate them in another way. If the area is big, we must go back down in there. If we don't burn it out and construct a second fire guard or fire line inside there and thereby isolate this area from burning. Uh-huh. A uh, call now from Port Alberni. Go ahead, please. Hi. Uh, you were saying something about the, the uh, firestorms. Could you expand upon that a bit? Yes. Um, firestorms are a, um, a natural phenomena. They don't occur very often in the normal course of events. However, as it happened in the last two years in the far north of BC, we did have fires that uh, got to the size and the magnitude where they actually create their own uh, weather. They create such an incredible amount of convection from the heat of the fire itself that they are referred to as firestorms. And from an energy point of view, probably would have the same amount of energy in one of those storms as you would find in a huge uh, cloud with lightning and thunder and all that sort of energy. Does that answer your question? Let's go to the next question. It's uh, from Squamish this time. Go ahead, please. Hi, I was wondering what the average depth would be when you dig down in the soil before you reach mineral soil. Aha, uh -huh, there's a good one. Well, in Squamish, in some of your coast types there, it's quite a ways. I've seen um, uh, guards constructed or, or mineral soil guards constructed in that area were two or three feet before you got below your duff layer and into mineral soil. It's pretty easy to uh, remove that material, mind you, compared to and get to the dirt. So you end up with a, a virtual ditch as opposed to the Kamloops area where your mineral soil may only be a couple of inches below the surface. Yeah, the duff is uh, quite soft. That's right, but it will burn. Once it dries out, once you expose it to temperatures, it may appear wet, it'll soon dry out, and then the fire will sneak across your, your the, what you think is the mineral soil guard. Okay, thank you. Over to you, Fred. Okay, thanks, Jim. Uh, one other question, one other point I would really like to clear up, and which is a, uh, a big question in uh, firefighters' minds, especially the, uh, the junior people who have uh, not had a lot of experience in uh, constructing a guard or fighting a fire, and that is what direction do you throw the material that you're digging out uh, or pushing away from the surface, like the surface fuels, the litter, the uh, pine cones, uh, the grasses, the duff. <coughs> you throw it inside the fire guard or do you throw it outside? And the rule is, if you're, especially if you're in the parallel or indirect attack method, if you're away from the burning edge of the fire, or away from the fire perimeter, you throw everything out or away from it. You don't want to add fuel to the fire that it can uh, pick up and burn in. And as you're throwing these fuels out, you want to disperse them around. You don't want to throw them in a big pile and create another potential fire hazard. If you're working right alongside the fire line or the fire perimeter or the fire edge and you're unsure of whether the material that you're dealing with is burning or not burning, you should throw it inside the fire and again spread it out so that it is dispersed and you don't create a, uh, an area to flare up. So the rule is if it's not burning and you're away from the fire edge, throw it out. If it's close to the fire edge and you feel it may be burning, throw it in, but disperse it. Uh-huh. Jeff, um, this question of uh, fires burning uphill and downhill, this is a, an interesting one. They're more dangerous in which direction? Well, obviously, um, Jim, we would never expose our people to um, the front edge of a fast-running fire. It is just not done, and it's obvious that we wouldn't put anybody in a position where they might be threatened by that fire. And this could be probably expressed in a situation like this, where we would never allow people to get in, in, in into an area like this, unless the flames are perhaps one or two feet high. But there are some dangers uh, for the people working on the flanks and on the uh, rear part of the fire that's spreading in this direction too. And that's, uh, as I mentioned before, from the material rolling down the hill out of the fire snags falling down and so on. So even though you may be working in the area where it isn't really hot and uh, there is no danger from the flames, you still have to watch out for these obstacles. 
Uh, maybe Fred for this one. What uh, the most important thing? What should a crew do to get to the scene of the fire? First things to be done. Again, uh, Jim, there's no general rule because each fire uh, is different, and the crew boss or straw boss he must size it up, and he must decide what the initial action will be. And this is where his assessment of the fire uh, is very important. He must draw on, on his experience, what he feels the fire is going to do, what the weather is, where the fuels are, uh, where the hazardous points are, where the danger spots in the fire. And uh, depending on the fire and what it's doing, and say all these other factors, that will determine or direct what his initial action will be on that <coughs> fire. What can I expect out of the straw boss, the guy that I'm reporting to, on say a, a, a big one, a big project fire and a smaller fire when there aren't so many levels? of administration on the, on the scene? On the smaller fire, Jim, uh, your straw boss uh, will work very closely with you. Actually, to make a difference of the size of the fire, I'll be working very closely with you at all times. He will direct you as to the width and depth of the fire line. Uh, he will space you. He will uh, tell you when to take a break. Uh, he will decide, uh, uh, again, whether to uh, move around the fire. He will really direct every action that you, that you take on the fire. I'll be working very closely with you. He will probably train you a bit in certain aspects uh, that he feels are necessary. Now, on a large fire, again, your relation to the straw boss will vary very little, regardless of the size of the fire. It's a very close contact, a very personal one, and uh, it's almost constant. It's almost like your mom. Cases. Just about. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, roots. Where do, uh, what ex to what extent are roots a problem, a particular problem? Roots are a problem probably in Cases where you've got old trees or old dead trees, and the roots are dead, but they're still in the ground, they've got a lot of pitch in them, and the fire burns up an old rotten stump or, a, or an old pitchy stump, and it will then burn down through the roots and right under a fire guard underground. Live green roots uh, are not so much of a problem, in, at least initially. Certainly they can dry out, and a fire can creep along live roots, but they're not near the problem that the dead roots are. The dead roots are along snags, old stumps that have been uh, logged many years ago. Those are the real problem ones. Get, uh, Jeff, maybe get you to do this one, the uh, uh, difference between direct and parallel, reviewing those things for me. Okay. Um, the main issue here, of course, is number one, that we're removing the fuel because we are not very successful in wildfires in removing heat or oxygen. The uh, direct method is used where it's uh, physically possible with no danger and no severe heat to the crew to work right on the fire's edge. Now, when we say, just let me interrupt you, when we say remove, we mean cut off from. We, yeah, you, yeah you, you dig the mineral foil guard, you, throw the, the, fuel you throw the fuel out, and uh, then as, the, as you work along the, the flanks of the fire, if the... Uh, if fire intensity is such that you can't work as close as you would wish to work, then you move away and then it becomes a parallel action, which brings us to burning off and all those other things that have to be done. Quick the telephone call from Port Alberni. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'd like to find out what percentage you need to pass the exam. I believe last year, I'm sorry I can't ask, answer that for this year, uh, your facilitator will be able to answer that for you. Do you have a facilitator, sir? Yeah. Uh, if you could uh, put the question to him. Okay. Here's a good one. Difference between burning, burning off and backfiring. Okay. Um, burning off is done practically in every, every case, and it can happen, in, especially in light fuels, almost simultaneous with the action. Uh, if you have a crew that's perhaps hitting not the head of the fire, but close to the head in an indirect approach, starting off from the top of the fire and coming down both sides. In light fuels, as soon as that guard is, mineral soil guard is constructed, they start burning off right then and just follow down behind the crews that are constructing the mineral soil guard. Backfiring is a situation where the fire is, uh, in most cases, totally out of control, uh, shown very uh, dramatically in some of the films and slides that have, you've seen today. Then an experienced fire go boss, uh, without any <clears throat> uh, direct uh, availability to him at all, would perhaps through m various methods of ignition, would go back to a road or a creek or, a, or a, an area where you have a natural, brace, uh, natural break and no fuel. And when the convection, see, there's always two... Um, actions with convection heat. One from the main fire that comes up, and as the main fire comes up, 
like a chimney, there's a reverse flow of air coming in from the other side. So then you would backfire into that reverse wind and the backfire would suck right into the main fire. Very spectacular and very effective on large fires. Wow. Uh, water isn't that big a deal. If you can't get water to the fire, it's not a major catastrophe. No. As a matter of fact, uh, we use water for, as I said before, cooling off hot spots, uh, removing to a degree the oxygen, and bringing the fire into a situation where you can take direct action on the fire at no uh, threat to the firefighters. Let me try this out on you as a city slicker. A you know, fireman putting out a building fire in Vancouver, uh, or well, for, any, any, for that matter, dumps water all over the place. Uh, using forest fire techniques, he cut off the unburned part of the house, wouldn't he? That's right. You would, the fuel. And, and as a matter of fact, uh, the only way that they were able to stop the infamous San Francisco fire was by blasting down blocks and clearing a sufficient area there that the fire didn't continue to spread. Not a very good technique for structure fires, but uh, very common in the way that we fight fires. Uh huh. Um, is it tape time? Should we go to tape? Let's do that. This is uh, our last module, module six. This is on mop up and patrol, and we'll be back right after to answer more questions. You are watching module six, mop up and patrol. Module six also contains a review of the entire basic fire behavior and suppression course. Module five, dealt with the suppression of fire. The suppression of fire ends when the fire has been contained and is clearly under control. You will recall that the three basic rules of forest fire fighting are fast attack, aggressive action, prompt and complete mop up. It is now time to apply rule three, prompt and complete mop up. Mop up is the act of making a fire safe after it has been brought under control. This includes extinguishing or removing burning fuel along or near the control line and felling snags. Mop-up starts immediately after the fire is under control, even if it rains. On small fires, all smoldering fuel is extinguished. On large fires, the strategy is to work inward from the fire line and extinguish as wide a strip as possible so that there is no possibility of sparks, rolling fuel or flare-ups crossing the fire line. Water, which is not often used in the control of the fire, is used wherever possible in the mop-up stage. All snags within the burn area are felled by experienced firefighters. All concentrations of fuel near the outside of the fire line are scattered or removed. Sometimes burning fuels are buried when that is the fastest way of stopping the possibility of sparks being blown across the fire line. However, these fuels must later be uncovered to extinguish any fire left in them unless the boneyard or graveyard concept is used. That is, the fuels are moved into a pit. The fuels are not in contact and mineral soil is used to cover the fuels. Heavy fuels, which are near the inside of the fire line, are moved towards the burned area. Burning fuels are scattered back into the burned area. The rule of thumb is burned or doubtful fuels go inside the fire line. Unburned fuels go to the outside of the fire line. Fuel materials left from burning off are moved well inside the fire line to reduce the risks of sparks and fire. Stumps and windfalls are checked for fire inside the bark or underneath them. They are tested with bare hands. This is called cold trailing. The fire line is improved and checked for continuity. The fire line is checked for hidden roots which could carry the fire under the fire line. Such roots are removed. Any doubtful areas are cold trailed. A check is made that there is no fuel which could roll across the fire line to spread the fire. It is trenched or it is blocked or it is turned. Fuels which will burn promptly and safely are left to burn. A continual check is made for any smoldering spots outside of the fire line. An infrared scanner is sometimes used. This will detect heat which is not apparent to the eye. Fire is chopped out of heavy fuels and the chips are either scattered or extinguished. To allow a fire to restart after it has been brought under control, 
is considered a cardinal sin by forest protection people. This can only happen as a result of inadequate mop-up procedures. Rule number three, prompt and complete mop-up, is no less important than rule number one, fast attack, or rule number two, aggressive action. The last action on a fire is the patrol, where the fire line is inspected for any sign of fire renewal to prevent escape over the fire line. Depending on the conditions, the fire boss may order patrols to be done for as long as five to ten days after the fire is under control. Even after routine patrols are removed, the fire could still be smoldering. Patrols are usually organized under the straw boss. The patrol action starts immediately after burn-off. People on patrol stay within calling distance of each other in case they need help. People on patrol will use shovels, axes, or Pulaski tools, and or hand tank pumps. Water is used sparingly. Patrols must patrol, that is a patrol must keep moving. A spot fire could be starting up just around the next bend. The most important aspect of this program is the emphasis on safety. Everyone, starting with you, has a personal interest in your safety. Because safety on the job cannot be overemphasized, and firefighting can be an extremely hazardous occupation, the Ministry of Forest Protection Branch has adopted two keywords. These are watch out. Watch out is an acronym for the eight essential firefighting safety commandments, which every firefighter must memorize and follow. This approach to fire line safety was recommended recently by an international committee of firefighting agencies studying fatalities and near fatalities on forest fires. The eight essential safety commandments which you must memorize are W stands for weather, which dominates fire behavior, so keep informed. A stands for action, which must be based on current and expected fire behavior. T stands for tryout. Try at least two safe escape routes. C stands for communication, which should be maintained with crew, boss, and adjoining forces. H stands for hazards. Hazards to watch for include flash fuels, chimneys, and snags. O stands for observe. Observe changes in wind direction, velocity, humidity, and clouds. U stands for understand. Understand your instructions and make sure yours are understood. T stands for think. Think clearly. Be alert. And act decisively before your situation becomes critical. These two simple words, watch out, embody the key points to ensure your personal safety on the fire line. Your facilitator will give you this watch out card to help you memorize these key points. To help you with your review process before you write your examination, we will now summarize the highlights of this basic fire behavior and suppression course. One, remember from the fire triangle, the removal of either fuel, heat, or air will extinguish a fire. Two, the rate at which a fire burns will vary depending upon the variables of fuel, weather, and topography. Three, to completely extinguish a small fire with dirt requires the separation of burning materials, the packing of mineral soil solidly over fuels to exclude all air, the tramping down of dirt, and the building of a fire line to mineral soil around the burn. Four, to completely extinguish a small fire with water requires the separation of burning materials, the scraping of charred wood, the digging, chopping, and soaking of each piece of fuel, the puddling of hot spots, and the building of a fire line to mineral soil around the burn. Five, the standard objective in all our firefighting activities in British Columbia is to control each fire by 10 a.m. of the day following discovery. All plans are made with this objective in mind. This means hitting fast and hitting hard with sufficient men and equipment to accomplish the objective. Six, before taking full action on a fire, there must be a plan of attack. Follow the plan with your straw boss. Seven, the three basic methods of attacking a fire are the direct, parallel, and indirect methods. 
The latter is only attempted by very experienced fire protection officers. 8. Control action on the fire line should begin at first light of each day. In order to do this, breakfast and travel must be completed before first light. 9. The five basic work functions in fire line construction are line location, clearing, grubbing, burning off, mop up, and patrol. 10. It is always better to have too many fire tools on the fire than too few. What tools you take to a fire, you bring back. 11. The choice of fire tools and equipment must fit the circumstances. Obtain the knowledge of what tools do what jobs best. 12. No fire, whether large or small, is considered safe until surrounded by a fire line to mineral soil. 13. No fire line is considered complete until the burning off of unburned fuel between the line and the fire has been accomplished. 14. There are good uses for water on every fire, provided it is used efficiently and not at the expense of manpower better utilized elsewhere. 15. Water finds its greatest consistent use in mop-up operations. 16. Once a fire is controlled, it must be safeguarded. This means strong patrols and vigorous mop-up. Don't lose a fire after all the hard work of control has been done by sloppy patrol and mop-up procedures. 17. Every firefighter is only human and requires good food and rest. You are responsible for your safety by being properly dressed, obeying instructions, and operating in a safe manner. With a good knowledge of the basics, most firefighting requires only the application of good common sense. This is your last opportunity to give us a call here and with any questions remaining. Numbers again for Greater Vancouver 228-1411. Uh, the toll-free number, if it's long distance, 112-800-663-1277. While we're waiting, uh, Fred's at the board to give us some good uh, sum-ups of a good mop-up. Thank you, Jim. Yes, mop-up is a, uh, probably one of the most important aspects of uh, fire uh, extinguishment once you've got the thing contained. I'd just like to give a little review. Say we have a fire that looks something like that, and we'll say that we've got our fire guard, our fire line, around it, all the areas are burned out, and the fire guard is directly adjacent to the fire edge or fire perimeter. We then, once the, uh, we've gone through, say, attack, and we've got the fire contained and pretty well under control, we want to make sure we keep it under control. And to do that, we go through the procedure known as mop-up. And this is where we uh, may widen our fire guard, our fire line, strengthen it, either on the outside, but then most importantly is to work inwards on the fire. The first, probably the first stage of mop-up is to knock down any smoldering hot spots. You might have little flames, uh, little hot spots to knock them down, put the fire out completely by mixing with mineral soil, uh, probably uh, putting a little water on them, excluding oxygen, and cooling the area off. Following that, you hit all other areas along the inside of the fire perimeter, and you work in concentric circles, putting out all hot spots, all burning embers, and there, in effect, you widened your fire line to whatever width that happens to be. It might be two meters, might be uh, five meters, whatever it is. Once you've got that done and all fire is out within this area, you then move in and make another circle around the fire and do that until ultimately you've got the whole area out. And completely out, all smokes are dead, everything is buried, or uh, better yet, mixed with mineral soil, cooled off, mixed with water, and uh, dead out. And with that, maybe I'll come back to you, Jim. Good, let's take a couple quick calls. First to Williams Lake, good afternoon, and what's up? Yes, I was wondering, can you get UIC benefits off firefighting? The normal, uh, uh, answer to that is no. If you are hired strictly for fire suppression purposes, uh, we do not deduct unemployment insurance. On the other hand, you can make uh, the uh, contribution to the uh, um, federal fund and therefore you are actually eligible for UIC. Okay, thank you. One other call from uh, Port Alberni. 
Yeah, Hello? after a water bomber drop, what happens about the uh, water runoff? Like, uh, if it's at the bottom of a slope, does it pose any problems to falling timber or the people that are standing at the bottom, like, getting washed away or what? Oh, no, the retardant that we use is not uh, water, and it's not all that... Uh, uh, it's fairly thick goop, if you will, uh, and it sticks to the trees and it sticks to the ground. It doesn't uh, wash down. Now, if that's, I'm talking about our contract air tankers with long-term retardant. Uh, if you're ever involved with the Martin Mars operation, which uh, uh, is on the Vancouver Island and owned by the companies out there, yes, the Martin Mars uh, has the capacity, if they're flying fairly low, to actually create a uh, enough water that you would uh, notice some washing, but uh, that is not a common occurrence. Okay? okay? Fred, let me ask you this one. What does the term puddling mean? Does that make any sense to you? Tools and water in, 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 the, in, context, in the context of MAPA? Yes. Many times uh, when you get uh, an area that's been burned over and you've had very high temperatures, the soil, uh, the fire many times will change the soil structure and actually uh, create a condition of that so known as hydrophobic, that is, it, it actually sheds water. And you get this combined sometimes with compacting from equipment uh, or uh, even people walking on it, and you get a rainfall on top of this uh, soil, or these areas have been compacted or heavily burned, this, the water will not penetrate and will just remain on the surface and therefore puddle up on top. And this can create real problems with uh, erosion, uh, soil runoff, and many times this can create or cause more damage than the actual fire does. A telephone call from Gibsons. Go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, I'd like to find out uh, how uh, you, you uh, can find out where fires are burning and, and how you could get on, like, if there's in, in, a, in other areas. Okay, if you're in the uh, Gibsons area, you would contact the district office in uh, Seashalt, who would inform you as to the fire activity locally. The, uh, they, I would ask at that point that they might contact the Vancouver Regional Office for you to find out if firefighters are needed uh, in the Vancouver region. They would also know in the Vancouver Regional Office uh, whether there's firefighters required anywhere else in the province. Okay, the, uh, the, it must be a gigantic mop-up after some of these fires. Um, and I, I hear the term boneyard or graveyard. Can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, uh, Jim, what we have to do in order to make mop-up work with a minimum amount of water that's usually available to the fire suppression team is that you take advantage of the non-effects of radiant heat. In other words, if you have two pieces of burning material that are very close together, as you might in your fireplace again, mm -hmm. there's a certain amount of radiant heat that goes back and forth, but it, the distances traveled are very limited. Mm -hmm. You move that material apart, perhaps use a little bit of water to reduce the combustion that's going on there. Um, swing the material if you're on a steep slope so that it won't roll down the hill and methodically put the, the fire out in that manner. That, once done, is referred to as a boneyard and you just work through the whole area doing, you're doing using that log technique. by log. Uh, log by log uh, and branch by branch and, and so on and, and making sure that your ground fuels in the duff layer are extinguish at the same time. Again, you seem to be saying that water here is optional. Water is optional. It's very useful, but if uh, to stand in one place with a uh, fire hose, as uh, structure firefighters might, wasting time. Uh -huh. A call now from Campbell River. Your question, please. Hi. I'd like to know what you mean by the term coal trailing. So would I. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you want to answer that, Fred? Uh, coal trailing, there's... Uh, Probably two different terms. Again, this is the semantics and terminology that goes with firefighting, and they are confused. Uh, many times, cold trailing is where you actually construct a trail, uh, a fire guard, or a fire line along a fire perimeter where the fire is actually cold. That is, uh, you've, you're, you're building a, a trail where the fire is already burnt and it's out. But you do this because you're not sure that that fire is out, and mop procedures have not yet started. Uh, yeah, again, a strengthening of your fire line, you know, your fire protection and something to work off from uh, when you're walking, say, to or around the fire to inspect it, and also to assist you in mopping up. That's one terminology or one type of cold trailing. Probably the other one is uh, 
more common and is used where you actually used in mop-up where you uh, go around the edge of the fire, as I illustrated on the board, and you're actually uh, making sure the fire is cold. You're making a trail of cold fuel or creating your boneyard, extending the boneyard, as Jeff explained, and therefore creating a, a trail of cold material behind you, therefore the term cold trailing. Uh, telephone call now from Houston. Good afternoon. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, the people here are interested in uh, some more information on the fire retardant dropped from the air tankers, and I guess specifically what chemical is used in the retardant and approximately how long we could expect it to work. Okay. Excellent question. Basically, the uh, long-term retardant that we use is, uh, <clears throat> consists of several chemicals, but the most uh, uh, common is diammonium phosphate. Uh, when it's applied on the edge of a fire, it actually uh, sets up a chemical reaction which accelerates combustion for a, a many seconds, if you will, uh, and then withdraws the oxygen from the air for a brief period of time, which causes the fire to uh, terminate. Uh, it never extinguishes the fire, but it does cool things off enough for people on the ground to get in and take uh, aggressive action with hand tools and so on. I guess the other point here, of course, is that uh, with air tankers, uh, if you are on a fire where air tankers have contained that f the fire by putting uh, retardant all the way around it, you should work inside that fire area created by the air tanker fleet. Don't waste that uh, long-term retardant. It is just as good uh, dried out as it is totally wet. It's a very valuable tool for you. And uh, obviously, then the shelf life of returning once applied on the ground around the perimeter of the fire is as long as it's there. In other words, if it's washed away by rain, it's no longer effective, but it is up until that time. Is there a, let me get you to say something about these. Uh, I guess there's two functions, one mop up and the other patrol. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> is there a tendency to uh, let your guard down when you think the thing's out, there isn't a lot of smoke around anymore? Uh, yes, uh, Jim, and I think probably the key problem there is that uh, if we are working with the same people that have been on that fire from the start, even if they're only there for one day, is that they're physically exhausted by uh, everybody wants to pitch in and get that fire contained and perhaps would enthusiastically work in the mop-up stage. When you get to patrol, it's very easy to say, we've got it and let your guard down. Don't uh, maintain good observation of the extremity of the fire. Look away from where the fire is, watching for hot spots and spot fires and things like that. I noticed that on the uh, tape there was uh, hardly any smoke at all on the shots where he saw the patrols. At what point do you know when to call it quits on the straw boss system? That's right. Uh, it wouldn't never be up to the uh, opinion of the firefighter that the fire was in fact out. In fact, we have some pretty sophisticated uh, uh, infrared equipment now that we use uh, from a helicopter or on the ground to determine whether there are some hot spots that aren't visible. That can tell you within uh, almost a few degrees what's hot and what's not, isn't it? That's right, and uh, it's quite easy to... It saves us money by, if you have a relatively large fire, the uh, uh, fire may be scanned and then we can let the fellows go home because the fire is indeed out, or identify those hot spots there that aren't visible. Fred? Yes, Jim, just a couple other comments on uh, detecting hot spots. Uh, of course, the uh, best way to do this is by feel, but you, know, you can get your hand burned too. <laughs> exactly. But this is where you tie in uh, like the procedure of mop-up and patrol together. You patrol the fire, you walk around the perimeter, or you patrol your little section of line that you're in charge of, and you actually use your eyes, you look for smoke, uh, you use your nose, you uh, detect uh, burning areas just by smelling the smoke here. You can sense it, sometimes just a sixth sense. I know some firefighters are very good at just almost sniffing out a fire. And another technique is to look for a little hovering insects, especially in the cool of the morning. Insects like warm spots, and uh, I've detected many hot spots on fires just by looking out and uh, seeing a little group of little gnats flying in a uh, little swarm together, and you reach down underneath them and it's hotter than a firecracker. So you can use different techniques uh, to detect these fires. And of course, the, the ultimate one in, in the uh, today's technology are the infrared scanners, uh, as mentioned by Jeff. To the telephones. I believe it's Williams Lake first. Hello. Um, could you tell me how a ground crew can uh, control a ground fire? Uh, not very successfully. 
what we generally happens in a situation like that is that the crown fire will only last on a relatively small fire, for instance, uh, one or two hectares. The crown fire will only last for five or ten minutes, or uh, periods of that duration, depending on the type of fuel, or in, in, unless it just gains momentum and goes into uh, an uncontrolled fire, which which will burn at least uh, till darkness that night. So what happens in a situation like that is that uh, uh, the crews would be brought into a marshalling area uh, on a small fire situation I'm talking about. Uh, the crown fire would take place and then you would go back uh, to that fire and carry on after the crown fire has taken place. Uh, one more call from Vernon. Hello? Um, I was going to ask, uh, considering uh, often uh, smaller numbers of workers are uh, relied upon uh, to uh, uh, take over a fire, uh, and the government is relying on a smaller number of workers for long shifts, why doesn't the ministry compensate workers for the long hours of overtime that are put in? Um, yeah, uh, that's a fair question. I think you have to remember here, of course, is that the we, we are uh, sort of divided emotions uh, in terms of uh, re compensation for fire suppression. We do have an obligation to the taxpayer to minimize our fire costs. At the same time, we want uh, the fire suppression uh, people to be compensated at a re reasonably fair rate of pay. We don't want to compete with other agencies or the industry in terms of fire suppression. Um, <clears throat> I think it's a fair question to, to say why do not we, or why don't we pay overtime, but at the same time, uh, it, it is, we don't uh, expect to ever uh, compete with other people that may or may not be in a position of, of unions and uh, more structured jobs, okay? Fred, just let me get this, uh, is it, should you actually, in cold trailing, should you actually put your hands right in the ground? Is, should, should we be going for that? Is that a... Yes, Jim, as I mentioned before, there are different techniques for the, uh, making sure a fire is out. Yeah. And feeling it with your hands is the, probably the best uh, way for the fire. Uh, how then do you guard against the burns? Uh, you guard against burns, you put your hand down close to the ground first and feel, look for the insects, put, look for put smoke. Put them down carefully. Carefully. <laughs> I get it. And you don't put them on it. <laughs> okay. Uh, one or two other quick things. Uh, is the fire completely out by the time of the cruise on patrol? Yes, no? No. We uh, never consider a fire out until most, most of the time for days after we, co we consider it out. We generally leave people there for four or five days after we have convinced ourselves that, that it's out, just in case it, it, uh, it, uh, there's a smoldering part and then it starts to build up. The worst possible situation that I can conceive is to have a fire, all that energy, all that money invested in it, and then it to get away again is just a cardinal sin. What's the difference between, uh, we're almost out of time, but containment and control? Is there any? Not really, no. We consider the fire to be contained when the mineral soil control line is around it. But if you have uh, unburned areas within that uh, uh, fire control line, then it isn't really considered controlled at that point. Once it's burned off, then it can be considered under control. Okay, I think we're just about out of time. Um, this is the end of our telecourse and basic fire behavior and suppression. We hope that you've enjoyed this. We hope it's been of some use to you. Uh, good luck with your tests. Uh, if you have any questions, there's your facilitator there, we hope, and, and then it's on to the test, and again, good luck with those. I thank you both for being with me, Fred and uh, Jeff, and uh, bailing me out of some tight spots. Glad to be here today, Jim. It's been a well, on behalf of the Ministry of Forests, uh, from us in the studio to you, all the best with your tests. If you haven't taken the test and would like to do so, call a protection officer at the Ministry of Forests in your area. Thank you and good afternoon. You have been watching the program Basic Fire Behavior and Suppression. The program was designed by the Forest Service Training School and is sponsored by the Protection Branch of the Ministry of Forests. The Protection Branch is responsible for fire management and pest and disease control in our forests. Technical assistance was provided by the audiovisual section of the Information Services Branch of the Ministry of Forests.
You're watching the Knowledge Network, British Columbia's educational television authority, transmitted to over 130 communities in BC by Canada's Annex C satellite.